On October 8th of 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed most, or about a third, they say, of, of Chicago. So the devastation was immense. About a third was destroyed. Some 300 lives were lost, and about somewhere around 100,000 were homeless. And the estimated damages is said to have reached nearly 200 million. Amongst the people who experienced the loss was a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. He was a lawyer and a real estate investor. And it is said that the fire destroyed his real estate investments. And it was somewhere around about this time as well that they, him and his wife Anna lost their son, who was four at the time, to scarlet fever. In 1873, the Spafford family decided to take a trip to Europe. A family trip, it was. But due to some last minute business obligations, Horatio made a last minute plan to stay behind. He sent his family on ahead. He stayed behind to take care of business and he was going to join them sometime later on. Somewhere along the voyage, his wife and four daughters, of his wife and four daughters, the ship tragically collided with another vessel and it sank. And Horatio's four daughters who were left of his family were all lost in the shipwreck. He received a telegram from his wife, Anna, once she reached Europe that said, saved alone, what shall I do? So Horatio is said upon receiving the wife, his wife's telegram, gets on the next ship, boards the next ship available, and heads to Europe to join his grieving wife. And as they passed over the spot where his, the ship that had sunk, that had claimed the lives of his four daughters, Horatio penned these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. These words then went on to become the first verse of the hymn that we all love very much. It is well with my soul. We sing it here at church. Today our focus, however, is not going to be Horatio. It's not going to be about Horatio Spafford or his family. It's not going to even necessarily be so much about the hymn in and of itself. Rather, our focus is going to be on the very reasons why a Christian can confidently say it is well with my soul in even the most dire circumstances. And those reasons are going to be found in Christ alone. If you could, turn with me to the book of Psalms, where we're going to continue with chapter 42, where we left off, uh, left off a few months ago. And as a quick reminder, it is not noted who the author of this psalm is, but many, including Charles Spurgeon, Matthew Henry, and other commentators believe it to have been David written at the time where Absalom, his own son, had conspired against him and David found himself exiled away from God's people, away from the house of God as he was fleeing his son. The psalm is divided in two stanzas, each, with each stanza ending in an, in an almost identical refrain. The last time I preached... We looked at verses 1 through 5, and today we're going to focus on verses 6 through 11. And in a moment, I'm going to invite you to follow along with me as I read through the entire chapter. As we read, take special note on how the psalm progresses. In verses 1 through 5 that we covered the last time, the psalmist is experiencing an unquenchable thirst. And the description is used as a deer pants for the waters, as a panting, there's an unquenchable thirst that is happening, He's thirsting for God. He was longing to be in the house of the living God with God's people, participating in public worship of the one true God. As we move from verses 1 through 5, there's a progression that starts taking place. The panting has ceased, and David has moved into a weaving, more of a, like a weaving in and out of despair, hope, 
Back to despair, back to hope, back to despair and hope. And I want you to note how he despairs as he considers his circumstances. He looks at his circumstances and despair settles in. He was looking at his circumstances in the very light of what was happening to him in in the moment. And then as he moves from despair to hope, he starts to focus. It's almost like he's focusing on his circumstances. His circumstances are being focused more in light of eternity, in light of God, in light of God's promises. And in that, he starts to find hope. There's a glimmer that starts to shine. This weaving in and out of despair and hope happens about four times, and I believe as we read, you'll begin to notice it. So if you could, join me now at Psalm 42, verse 1, where we'll read the whole chapter. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for, the, for God, for the living God. When shall I come and, ab- and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God, with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. O my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan, in the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Before we get into the text any further, let's come before the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you and humbly ask that you would help us understand your word today. Give us ears to hear. Soften our hearts to receive what you have in store for us. And may we leave this place encouraged to serve you all the days of our life because of so great a salvation that you have provided for us through the work of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. He's in the depths of despair, we could say, as we read verses 6 through 11. You can note in verses 6a, 7, 9, 10, and 11a, David says his soul is in despair. The waves of life, you might say, are rolling over him. And he's wondering why God has forgotten him. He's mourning because of the oppression of the enemy, and he describes the oppression of his enemies as the pain that comes from a shattering of bones. And his faith in God is being thoroughly tested as people are around him around him are asking where is your god i don't know about you but I, most of us probably have at some point in our life experienced someone who was laughing at us at our own expense and it didn't feel great maybe the first time it happened wasn't that bad but as time went on and it became ongoing it's the same old thing it's painful And so here's David, and it's going deep, because 
people are mocking him because they're saying, here he is. It's like, here you are in exile. Here's the thing. Look at what's happening to you. And you say you have a God, a living God? Seriously? But then consider how David goes about dealing with the despair he's feeling. He feels the despair. And immediately after, he reflects and reminds himself of God's promises. Take a look at verse 6 for an example. His soul is in despair, and he begins to pray. And as he prays, he remembers God from the land of the Jordan, and from the peaks of Hermon, and from the Mount Mazar. Perhaps he's remembering how God had dried up the Jordan for the, for the children of Israel, and had allowed them to cross dry land uh, after the battle of Jericho. Maybe he's remembering how God had helped Israel in the land of the Hermonites. Uh, in Joshua 2, I believe it is where we read this, where they had defeated Sion, king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. And as he did so, as he reflected on these things, there's a glimmer of hope that you can catch coming out of the text. And I can almost hear him say, it is well with my soul. These things might be happening to me, but it is well with my soul. My God, even though the others say he's not alive, even though the others are mocking and laughing at me, my God is alive and it is well with me. Come what may, he will, my God will take care of me. As we continue our way through this text, I would like to spend the rest of our time considering three reasons why a Christian can see with confidence it is well with my soul, even in the most dire of circumstances. Let's consider reason number one. And in a moment, I'm going to give you that reason. However, before I do that, and to keep you curious so that you don't fall asleep here, we're going to have to journey forward. We're going to have to look at some, a few other scriptures in order to get some context here to the first reason. So stay with me as we take off. First, let's go back and let's, let's read verses 7 and 8 of our text this morning in Psalm 42. Let's just read those two verses. It says, the first one is, deep, uh, verse 7 says, Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. The Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and his song will be with me in the night, a prayer to the God of my life. Earlier this morning, we read Jonah 2, where Jonah cries out to God from the belly of the fish, and he uses very similar language. Now, Jonah literally had waves rolling over him. There was little water on top of him at this point. And we think, as we think of that, we think, well, that's a little bit worse than what David was experiencing. At least David was alive. He could breathe fresh air. And here's Jonah and as the billows are rolling over him, literally, I don't think we can think of a place more disgusting and difficult and horrible and terrible to be. But is there? Could there be more suffering than that? Well, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 53. In chapter 53 of Isaiah, he talks about a suffering servant. If you could, maybe earmark Isaiah 53, because we'll, we'll reference back to this a few times today. We're going to read right now 53, the first three verses, where he says, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. The servant of whom Isaiah is talking about sounds like he endured much. Matter of fact, there are a lot of similarities between the three verses we read and the verses in Psalm 42, verses 6 through 11. David was exiled, oppressed, reviled by his enemies. He was barred from the house of God. 
this servant, Isaiah, is talking about is also despised, forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, and he's acquainted with grief. The servant, of course, Isaiah is talking about is Christ. Is that something I'm doing, Ben? It, like, see, this is the type of stuff I do, though. Yeah, I break, I break things. <laughs> we'll keep going. That little humming that's happening is just a little bass, a little background noise that helps us, right? So the servant that Isaiah is talking about is Christ. And let's now go and consider a scripture that has given us a picture, that gives us a picture of the suffering that Christ endured, a picture of it. It takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. So turn with me, if you could, to the book of Luke, chapter 22. And we'll read verses 39 through 49. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 49. And here's Jesus in the garden. Verse 39 says, And he came out and, pro and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at that place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you might not enter into temptation. It's a pretty clear picture of the suffering that Isaiah is talking about. He's rejected by men. I mean, his, even, his own friends couldn't even stay awake in that last hour with him. They were overcome with sorrow by the sounds of it. We could say he's at death's door. Christ is at death's door. And he's fully aware of it. He doesn't, it's not like, oh, by accident, like I'm about to be killed here. He's like, he knew it was coming. But there is more to his suffering than meets the naked eye. He knows that he is about to drink the cup of God's wrath for the sins of his people. He's in agony. What David and Jonah experienced, and what we read in Psalm 42, and what we re read in Jonah 2, pales in comparison to what Christ was experiencing in the garden. Truly, we could say that Psalm 42, verse 7, when he talks about the billows and the waves rolling over him, Christ was experiencing this to the absolute fullest degree. The roaring waves of God's wrath for the sins of the ones he was going to save was about to come crashing down on Jesus Christ. Friends, the only reason Jesus Christ was suffering in that moment was because of his perfect obedience to the law of God. See, up to this point, he had obeyed perfectly in his life. What you and I could not do, what you and I fail to do every day, he did it perfectly. He was the only one fit to be sacrificed for our sins because he was the spotless Lamb of God. Just like David reflected on the loving kindness of God in Psalm 42, 8, and was encouraged by it, so too as we as the redeemed can take courage that no matter the circumstances, as we reflect on Christ's perfect obedience in drinking the cup of God's wrath, so you and I don't have to. We can take courage in that. He became the suffering servant, Isaiah talked about, in order to save us. So the first reason why a Christian can confidently say, it is well with my soul, in even the most dire circumstances, is because of Christ's perfect obedience in his life and death. Philippians 2.8 says this, 
being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And this leads us to the second reason. And of course, we're not going to just say the second reason because I need you to stay with me for just a little bit longer. So we're going to wait. We're going to go find the second reason together. But we're going to go back to, verse, uh, to Psalm 42, and we're going to consider verses 9 and 10, where he says, I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As a shattering of my bones, my adversaries revile me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? As we read these two verses, you and I both can say, we can know at this moment in time, that God really hadn't forsaken him. He really hadn't forgotten David. We can say that now, and even though David felt that way in that moment, he could look back later and say, you know what, God was in that. We have gone through dark times when we can look back and we say, you know what, God was in that. We don't see it in the moment, we see it later. In verse 10, he makes this comparison of a shattering of bones, which of course is an analogy that he's referring to. When I was younger, my dad owned and operated a pallet shop where we uh, would make pallets, with that, the, the, those pieces of those pallets, those wood, wooden things that you stack boxes and stuff on top of. I mean, Dell's seen plenty of them. So my older brothers, Matthew and Michael, had the job of taking the cut and processed boards and assembling them and then nailing them together to construct the pallet. Because we were older Amish, we weren't allowed to use all those newfangled automatic nailers that, every, that the big pallet shops use from eastern Pennsylvania and all over the place. And we used to drool over those things. We'd get these catalogs in the mail. And here it was, our, the, our company's uh, name was Cushman Pallet. And we'd get these magazines addressed to Cushman Pallet that is advertising these fancy machines that could just make our life so much easier. Well, that's all we did. We looked at them, drained them, drooled them, <laughs> and then we kept on going. So my dad rigged up a jig that was fastened to the wall where we could take our, we could take our, our, our lumber and you could quickly assemble it and then you could take the hand nailer, the hand air nailer that we were, we were allowed to have and just rattle across those boards and just, I mean, fire those nails into those, into those pallets as fast as we could go. And uh, the church allowed us to do that. So we could crank out about, a, I don't know, maybe about a semi-load a day is about what we could crank out. It wasn't more than that. Sometimes, when we were especially pushed to get an order of pallets out, I would come alongside my brother Michael, who nailed the bottom boards. And after the bottom boards are nailed, you're to take the, the, the pallet in its entirety, and bring it over here and stack it on a stack. And we used to stack them about 10, 10 to 11 high, where they then were rolled away, and uh, the forklift driver, usually my dad or my brother Nate, uh, would come and pick up that stack, and they'd start getting them ready for shipping. On a particular day, and I don't know, I must have been around 13 or 14 years old, I'm, I'm helping my brother Mike stack. And as he's nailing along, I all of a sudden notice that right over here to the, to the side, he missed about three nails. He missed the board. And as I am pointing to let, show him about the nails that he missed, and the very self-same time, he sees it. And he comes and he puts a nail in its entirety, head and all, straight through my index finger of my right hand. And there was a lot of whooping and hollering that happened right after that. As the pain settled in, there was like blood spurting out. And it had, the nail had split my, the, the bone. It sort of crushed my fingertip and it had split the bone wide open. There wasn't much to do about it. I mean, it's the tip of your finger, so you just kind of make do with it. But that's a splitting of bone. And it hurt. And, I, and for uh, some of you in here, you've experienced that. When something happens to your bones, it hurts. Sometimes you even have like this ache that goes all the way to the bones, and we, and we, ref, and we, make, we make reference of that. This is the type of pain that David describes as others are mocking him, making these jeers at him for believing in this God this living God that supposedly is out there. There was one 
who experienced so much more than a shattering of bones, though. He, too, was oppressed, reviled, and mocked by his enemies all the way to the point of death. And the worst part was that unlike David, God had truly forsaken him. So let's journey forward again. Let's head to Isaiah chapter 53, and let's read the rest of the chapter where we start, where we left off. So starting in verse 4. Verse 4 and through, on, on to the, uh, all the way through the end says this, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who can, who can, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man even in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, and the righteous, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. Note the language used in this pas passage is similar. It has a similar ring to the, to the language used in Psalm 42. He was smitten of God, crushed for iniquities, oppressed, afflicted, pierced for our transgressions. He was cut out of the land of the living, very similar to what David was experiencing in that time frame. Let's now head to Matthew 27, verses 33 through 50, to see again what was happening as Jesus suffered a death that he did not deserve. Matthew 27, verses 33 through 50, is where we'll be reading. And they came to a place, where, a place called Golgotha, which means place of skull. They gave him wine to, wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to watch over him there. And above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And in the same way, the chief priests, also along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot even save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come now, down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him in the same words. 
Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let's see whether Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded of his spirit. As we read this passage, I believe if I asked you all, we would all agree what David was struggling with in Psalm 42 pales in comparison to what Christ was suffering as God forsook him on that cross. In David's case, we can clearly say now that God had not forgotten him. On the cross, when Jesus cried out saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had truly forsaken him. And it is no wonder that Isaiah says, he was smitten of God, crushed for our iniquities, oppressed and afflicted, pierced for our transgression. He was cut out of the land of the living. This had to happen in order for justice to be served. So what does this mean? Justice must be satisfied. I like what Jerry Bridges says about the word justice, where he says, the word justice may be defined as rendering to everyone according to one's due. So, what do we owe? What is due? Well, first of all, we must get the fact that the Bible tells us that all have sinned. There is not one who does good. And if you want to know more about that, read Romans 3. We actually read it in Isaiah 53 this morning where we, no one does good. We have to get that part. We're all guilty of sin. And Paul describes it in Ephesians 2 as being, by nature, children of wrath. Secondly, we must understand that eventually we will all face judgment before a holy and just God. And according to the Bible, we all deserve death. Jerry Bridges, in his book, The Gospel for Real Life, says it best when he says the following, and I quote, As we think of that inevitable day of judgment, what do we want? Do we want to see justice done, or do we want mercy Except for the most arrogantly self-righteous among us, we would all hope for mercy. Here, however, is our dilemma. God's justice is certain, and it's inflexible. We have a big problem. Since God's justice is certain and inflexible, there is no escaping his judgment. No matter how much we hope that God would somehow have mercy upon us, he cannot. Justice has to be satisfied. Think about it. Imagine for a moment that there's a pedophile on the loose in Mahoning and Columbia counties where most of us live in. After many months of tracking this guy down, he's been apprehended and he's been tried, he's been found guilty of kidnapping multiple cases on multiple cases, um, all kinds of abuse and brutally murdering every subject that he's ever kidnapped. And now imagine with me how you would feel if on the day of sentencing we would find out that, hey, the judge had mercy on him. Hey, you let him go. He said, you know what? I see all this, looked at your rap sheet, but you know, I'm going to let you go. We would be enraged and we would all bring our kids inside and we would never let them go outside again. We would say, he's a terrible judge. And we would do whatever we could to try to remove him from office. Sadly, though, many people go through their entire life hoping that in the end, when they stand before a holy and just God, they're hoping that somehow their good works will outweigh their bad works and God will have mercy on them. And this is not how God works, though. He's not like the judge in the example of the bad judge that I just used. And as Jerry Bridges says, our dilemma is that God's justice is certain and it's inflexible. So what is the answer to our dilemma? 
If you're like me, you're now in complete full-out problem-solving mode. The answer of our dilemma lies in the cross. Through his death on the cross, Jesus fully satisfied the justice of God on our behalf. And because of that, dear Christian, you and I will come before a holy and just God, and he will say justified because of what Jesus Christ took upon himself, our sins, what he did, taking upon himself, our sins, dying on the cross, so that today we can live. And this is great news. This is cause for rejoicing. And so the second reason a Christian can confidently say, it is well with my soul, even in the most dire circumstances, is because justice has been satisfied through the finished work of Christ on the cross, and nothing can change that. It happened once for all, and it will not be redone. Even in the depths of despair, even the depths of despair will not take away the fact that as a believer, I am justified. And I will not need to experience God's wrath both today and in the final judgment. In closing, let's look at verse 11 of Psalm 42. David, as he also does in verse 5, goes into a question to himself. And it's almost as if he's chiding himself as he says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? I believe he's questioned himself in this manner because, as, as we've noted, he's reflected on God's loving kindness. He's reflected on God's promises. He's thought back on all the times that God has taken care of his people. And he showed up over and over and over and over and over again. And he's like, why are you in despair? This little thing that you're going through right now, why are you in despair? And as this settles in, David then goes on and he says to himself, Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Once again, David finds refuge under the wings of God. Hebrews 4, 14, verses 4, 14 through 16 says this. That's Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The third reason a Christian can confidently say, it is well with my soul, even in the most dire circumstances, is because the grave could not hold him. Jesus arose, he ascended, and he is now our perfect high priest. He is the only one who could perfectly obey the requirements of God's law, and he did it perpetually, meaning that not once did he mess up. Not even once, not in thought, not in word, not in deed, did he mess up. He did it perpetually. He is the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Christ's finished work is also personal. It wasn't some reckless love that took him to the cross. His death and resurrection was a sacrifice made to redeem his own. And you're Christian, that truly means we were on his mind when he died. When he suffered that day on the cross, we were on his mind. He is our only hope. Without him, we are lost and hopeless. Friends, the question is this. Where do you turn to when the going gets tough? When it gets a little rough and where despair wants to grip your soul? Do you turn to Christ or do you turn to the world? If you are anything like me, you may have even considered the wicked, looked at their ways, and had a slight tinge of envy 
that kind of hit you. I want you to think about something. The wicked will someday stand before a holy and just God. And they too, just like Christ, are going to experience his wrath. The difference, is, the difference, though, is that unlike Christ, who defeated death and rose again, the wicked will experience eternal judgment for their sins. If you are a Christian, you will not experience God's wrath because of Christ's finished work on the, cro- on the cross. And this is cause for great levels of gratitude. But why is it then that it seems so many of, the, of, of, of people who call themselves Christians are also amongst the most unhappy, saddest, ungrateful people that live on this planet. They seek after things, the same things the wicked seek after, to help alleviate their depression, their despair, their discouragement. And you might ask, wait a minute, are you saying we should just jump around and shout hallelujah every time it gets a little hard? And that's not what I'm talking about. To be clear, what I'm talking about what, to be clear, I'm not talking about some super positive thinking work here because if this was a formula, if this was all about a positive thinking formula, then it would start to remove our focus and would put it on ourselves and our work instead of the finished work of Christ. What I am saying is that so many who call themselves Christian don't always have the fruit. So many focus on their circumstances in light of only the pain they feel and in the moment and take little to no consideration to view the circumstances in the light of God's promises and what he did for us and and to so graciously save us. The wicked seek their best life now. The Christian's best life is to come. We are strangers in a foreign land when we find our souls in the depths of despair, let's not behave like the wicked and seek after the pleasures of what the here and now offers and affords. And instead, let's begin looking to Christ, the one who drank the cup of God's wrath for me, died the death I deserved, rose again, and ascended so I can live both today and forevermore. Truly, as a Christian, we have reason to say, it is well with my soul even in the most dire of circumstances. As we wrap up, this, of course, begs the question, do you know him? If you're sitting here today and you're hoping that somehow your good works are going to outweigh your bad works on the day of judgment, or you might even sit here and say, well, I never was really that bad. I mean, I have a lot of good works. And so I'm hoping that, you know, God's going to see my good works and say, you know what, thou good and faithful, come on in. I have some really bad news for you. It's not going to work. He's not going to be merciful to you if that's what's happening. The good news is, though, that if you're here today, there's opportunity. There's opportunity for you to call out to Jesus today and be saved. There's really no tricks. It's not complicated. There's no gimmicks. The Bible simply says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call upon him today, I urge you, and be saved. I invite you now to bow your head in prayer, a closing prayer with me. The prayer is called, Light Up My Conscience. I've chosen this prayer. It's a prayer by a Puritan named David Clarkson. So if you could, pray with me. Make me understand, Lord, where I have gone wrong. Make me recognize my transgression and my sin. Search me and try me, and then enable me to search and try myself with fairness over and over. Remove whatever might make me blind or narrow or distracted. Light up and awaken my conscience. It is your officer. So let it be your voice to faithfully represent your charges against me. Direct others and bless your word that it may be a searching, convincing light. Bring it all together that I, m- that I may understand when you contend with me and with your people and with these nations. Amen.